questions and to welcome you all for being here. I am just, I've been looking forward to this moment and rereading this beautiful book, as I know some of you online have already and some of you are, are about to, but it is such an honor, Juliet, to have you here leading this workshop on writing through grief and the creative process and finding healing through, through loss. We're, as, as you know, because we have chatted um, a great deal of our intention with alignment and the sessions we have um, and the people we bring to present to us is we are seeking peace through connection. And that is connection to whatever we might understand of the divine within us and beside us in relationships that we form and in the beyond us in the unknown um, and in the earth and how we have connection to the earth. And for a lot of us that um, seeking peace is peace from grief and grief in the obvious ways that we know grief in the loss of loved ones and a way of life or a dream, but also grief, as you know, in hidden ways and inherited ways. So it's a real honor to have you here to lead us through this workshop. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Juliet. Yeah, I'm so grateful to be here. And I really can't think of anything more important to be doing in the world than to connecting around peace. So thank you. Um, I'm going to talk uh, for about 15 minutes and kind of just explain um, the subject of my book and talk about how, how the book began. And then I'll give a short reading. And then I'm going to ask you <laughs> to participate in a short writing exercise. Um, so we'll see how big, we're a pretty small group, which is great in some ways. Um, but we'll see how, how many people join by the time we get to the exercise. We may just share in this group. So I'm going to um, share my screen now get this slideshow running. Um, so the genesis of my book, Sinkhole, began with the death of my father by suicide in 2008. But I also have two grandfathers who died by suicide. My father's father, Edward Patterson, uh, died in 1940. Um, he was a charismatic politician, a Democrat um, on the very far left side of Democrat in a, a district in southeastern Kansas that was not Democratic. And my mother's father, William McCluskey, who died in 1967, who came from a family of coal miners. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Neither of these men were discussed much in my life. My parents didn't talk about these men, certainly not their deaths, but also not their lives. It's almost as if they had disappeared from um, our ancestral line. And when my father died, it felt like this door swung open and I needed to walk through it and in part find out about these men. Um, I knew they had both died by suicide, but that's about all I knew. So I found out pretty quickly that I am not alone. Um, just to give you some brief statistics on suicide, 44,000 people die by suicide every year in America. Um, and for every person who dies by suicide, there are 115 people exposed to that suicide, of those 115, 25 people will have major life disruptions after that death. Um, that can be health problems or divorce or addiction problems. So I mention this only because uh, this, these kinds of deaths have an enormous ripple effect. And I think it's one of the reasons and a painful ripple effect and I think it's one of the reasons we're not very good at talking about suicide in particular. Um, to give you a little more context, 
we are seeing a steep increase uh, in what two economists, Ann Case and Angus Deaton, call deaths of despair. And this is unique to the United States if we compare the United States to other industrialized wealthy nations, we're not seeing these kinds of increases. So you can see that suicide itself, which is the blue line, doesn't exactly take a steep curve, but Anne Case and Angus Deaton make the argument that alcohol-related, drug-related deaths may also be kinds of suicides. So we might think of all of these deaths as deaths of despair or a kind of suicide. And so then if you just look at the top uh, line on the graph, you can see a very steep curve from roughly 2000 to the present, so the last 25 years. In fact, suicide itself has increased 25% in the last 25 years. I found this out really early in my sort of research process, and I really started to think very deeply about Suicide is kind of a social disease. And in fact, uh, the writer Donald Antrim uses that phrase in a beautiful memoir he wrote about his own um, suicidal attempts and ideation. And he talks about suicide really not as a disease, um, but as an illness with origins in trauma and isolation. And uh, I really took that to heart and started to wonder then about all these men in my life um, and wanting to understand them more deeply. And especially these two men who I knew not at all. So three sides, I'm sorry, both sides of my family, three generations come from a small town in uh, Kansas called Pittsburgh. So in order to find out more about these men, I went back to my parents' hometown of Pittsburgh. My parents were the only people in my family who left that town. They got married in the 1950s and moved to Minnesota where I was born. So Pittsburgh was not a place I knew very well. We didn't visit often as a child when I was a child. Um, so I started making these, I would even call them pilgrimages to Pittsburgh, primarily to do research. Um, and what happened is I ended up getting really involved in the history of this town. I can see now in retrospect that taking these trips allowed me um, to kind of spend time with my grief in a way that I wasn't able to in my own sort of life in Minneapolis where I live. Um, but I also could see that this land itself kind of held its own grief which I'll explain in a minute. About two years after my father died, I was on one of those trips and I went to my grandmother's house spontaneously. And when I got there across the street, there was a house um, that was raised up on cribbing and beams. And what you see here is a remediation of what had happened, but that area that you see all filled in with stone and chat was an enormous sinkhole. I had never seen a sinkhole in person. And when I encountered this scene, it felt like a metaphor had been delivered to me in the physical realm. And as a poet, I felt like I had to mine that metaphor. And in some ways, even though I was writing and researching for what I thought was my own benefit, the metaphor kind of helped crystallize the idea that I was writing a book. Um, so it turns out that Pittsburgh is at the top of a region called the Tri-State Mining District. And you can see that big circle is Pittsburgh and below is the mining region, which existed in the turn of the century, the 19th turn of the 20th century rather. Um, so they mined coal, and down in Pitcher, Oklahoma, they mined zinc and lead. Um, I knew a little bit about this because my grandfather came from a coal mining family, but I had no idea the extent to which um, this town was involved in mining. The region at one point was as big as Appalachia. It's all um, cleaned out now, but um, 
there was so much cold air that it was very, very active. So Pittsburgh is 80% undermined, and which means there's mine shafts under 80% of the town. Uh, the ground is stable mostly because of an aquifer, which keeps the mining rooms stable, but because of climate change and other things, the table is shifting. And so now we're encountering these sinkholes. Here's another one just outside of the town of Pittsburgh. So once I started getting interested in this town, I started driving around just like, a, you know, 10 to 30 mile re region around Pittsburgh itself. I'm just gonna show you a few pictures of what it looks like. Um, on the right is a site that was being remediated in Pittsburgh. On the left is uh, ridges left by strip mining in a nearby town in Galena. Here's some more unremediated strip land. It's one of the most ravaged ecological places I've ever seen. Um, and these pits that are filled with water, that is not clean water. It's very toxic, filled with chemicals and lead. And then this is a shot of Pitcher, Oklahoma, which is about 30 miles south of Pittsburgh. And those mountainous cliffs that you see are chat. So that's uh, waste from zinc and lead mining from 100 years ago. So I'm about to talk about grief, but I think what happened for me here, I was already in a grief state when I was visiting these places. But when I saw this landscape, I also felt a, a sort of a bigger, wider kind of grief. Um, and I began to tie, at least in my mind, around this metaphor, the idea of um, personal social suicide and ecological suicide. What I want to say about grief is that I think we are designed to know grief. I think we're designed to hold relationship with grief. And at its core, grief is an acknowledgement of love. I'm not sure that Western culture is the best at remembering these things. I think we tend to want to push it away because the feelings, as we've already suggested, are very painful, um, but in some ways, I, through this process of writing this book, feel like I came to understand again what it is to know grief, what it is to hold grief, and how grief really is connected or is an acknowledgement of love. I would describe grief as a kind of process, therefore, it's, it's kind of a complex pattern of activity for me, of inner and outer um, that unfolds over time. And I mention that because I think there's an oscillation in the process of grief. There's a back and a forth and a movement for how we process our pain and sorrow. And grief is very individual. Um, so the way one individual makes those swings from um, pain into you know, uh, stabilization, if you will, is very individual. But what I really noticed when I was going through this whole deep, acute grief is that there's so few spaces to be in grief communally. Um, of course, we have to swing back and forth, right? We can't be in these sorrowful states all the time, just as we can't be in denial states either. But I found that I could only kind of hold a stable middle place when I was with other people. It was when I was alone that I was swinging back and forth so much. So I've been really interested ever since in just how we might make more space together um, to kind of grieve together in ways. Ultimately, we have to attend to the body and I think that's one way that we have to metabolize grief. But I think I also started to think about grief itself as maybe a process, um, as possibly one of the most important, important effective tasks that we have in the 21st century. So as Margaret mentioned, and if it isn't already clear, 
I come from two people who I don't believe, you know, really knew how to face their grief. And I am a child in many ways of inherited grief. And so the process of searching for my grandparents really um, helped me to recognize that. Early on, I discovered a psychological model by these two psychotherapists, Terry Martin and Kenneth Doka. And they talk about intuitive grievers and instructional grievers. Intuitive grievers are people who express their grief primarily through emotion. That might mean, you know, really expressing emotions, and it might also mean shutting one's self off from people, isolating, curling up on the floor. Instrumental grievers are people who are oriented around problem solving or perhaps even taking action, creating foundations, making tributes, and even performing research. So when I when my father first died, I started to keep a journal and I hadn't kept a journal in years. And the journal, as you might imagine, was really a direct repository for my grief. And it was full of raw emotion. But I also very shortly after started researching this town where my parents came from, these men that I didn't know. And to go back to that idea of swinging back and forth, I could see that I swung back and forth between these two styles of grieving. Um, but what I would say is that and through the process of swinging back and forth between these two ways of being, is that by the end, I had a rich platitude of material. And I also had many different ways to grieve just in these two expressions for a, a period of time. And that really helped me metabolize my grief. So I think I'm gonna give you a short reading. I've selected something that kind of sticks to our topic. And I don't think I need to set it up too much, except to say that about a week before my father died, uh, I was in a terrible car accident. And I had a lot of soft tissue damage and a neck sprain. I was in a neck brace. And uh, I was really not physically well for uh, probably about four or five months. So there's some description of how um, I had been injured in this reading. Three days after my father's death, snow fell. I stood in my kitchen watching it blanket the roof of the garage, a line from E.E. E. Cummings. The snow doesn't give a soft white dam what it touches, filling my head. Friends had gathered for a makeshift wake at the house, and some of them were milling about a table of food nearby. Most everyone had brought something in a gesture of sympathy. The kitchen was covered with flowers, food, desserts, and bottles of wine. It looked something like a party, but it was nothing like a party. Though relieved to be in the company of those I love, I felt numb and shocked. I remember only silence, snow falling, my father trudging knee deep across my eye, mind's eye, but I know that isn't true. I must have spoken. Indeed, in the days that follow, I found myself repeatedly talking about what had happened. Looking back, I can see that the pressure I felt to explain was ex instinctual, a means of survival. I had watched my parents remain silent on the subject. For me now, it seemed as though I could talk about nothing else. Soon friends began avoiding me altogether or disappeared. The few who remained either changed the subject when I started talking or offered unhelpful advice. You've got to move on with your life. Put this behind you. Haven't you grieved enough already? It seemed as if they wanted me to preserve the silence around the issue of suicide that I'd unintentionally kept my whole life. One friend suggested I purchase a teddy bear for solace, 
and another failing to remember my car accident and the associated pain that still radiated through my body suggested exercise. And still another asked my permission to solicit a shamanic healer to contact my father in the beyond, which I gave unwittingly. I soon regretted my carelessness. The healer began emailing long and detailed accounts of my father's existence in a realm between this world and the next. I was either unwilling or unable to believe any of these efforts were in good faith, even though the friend who brokered the healer's services assured me good things would come of it. A few days later, the healer's last email arrived. He's crossed over, she wrote. His journey is complete but I'm sorry, there's no message for you. He seemed unwilling to talk. I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry at this news. I really had no use for this information, and yet I felt desperate for something material, something that would ease the loss. I began to have nightmares that kept me awake all hours of the night. My father no longer appeared in my dreams. Instead, objects vanished, went up in smoke. Parts of my body, arms and teeth fell off or disintegrated. Sometimes I found myself at an edge, cutting with knives, stringing a rope, and with each dream, a new turn of loneliness and fear. Reading was one way I tried to occupy my mind to avoid the worst of its wild tidal swings. And in the books I read, I learned that my isolation was a normal consequence of grief associated with suicide. The suicide bereaved, I was told, must not, not only attempt to cope with the death of someone close to them, but frequently must also do so in the context of stigma, shame, guilt, and confusion. In the seasons of my father's death, books massed piles on the floor. I wanted answers. I wanted to understand not just bereavement, but suicide itself. Who dies by suicide and why? Wasn't it helpful to know that grief of suicide is unique? That suicide was more common than murder in the United States? That I wasn't alone in my grief? that nightmares were common, that relationships became frequently strained in the wake of the death. Not really, but I still kept reading. I read and reread the few documents my father left behind, scoured the internet for my paternal grandfather, then read articles and journals and more books on suicide. Some of the reading was difficult, fueled bleak imaginings and filled my head with apocalyptic bits of information and strange facts. I wrote these all down in list form, making a taxonomy of my apprehensions. That list, when I read it now, is stark. I can see how little this information helped me to know or access my sorrow. Instead, it was the literary forms of solace I turned to that granted me passage to my feelings by way of voice. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear, C.S. Lewis wrote in A Grief Observed, published after the death of his wife. These words come to me now, looking over the notebooks I filled so many years ago. A Grief Observed was one of the few books that seemed to make sense of my experience. Grief, not only as sadness, but also as terror. When I speak of fear, I mean the recoil of the organism from its destruction, the smothery feeling, the sense of being a rat in a trap, wrote Lewis, an image I'd hold in my mind as a figure and description of grief. I felt like a rabbit caught in a snare was a phrase I sometimes used, should anyone ask how I was doing. All right.
So we're going to say that that was the exact passage that I <laughs> perfect part that I wanted to mention to you tonight. I'm so perfect. glad that you read that passage. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm going to ask us to try a little exercise. And the reason for the exercise, we were just talking before we got on this call about holding space for prayer or holding space for sharing songs and then also holding space for information, right? I think we're in a time when we need all of those things, but I'm here in the spirit of um, attending to grief in a communal way that isn't quite prayer. That's a little creative, but it could have prayer in it. So the first thing we're gonna do is a meditation, a short meditation exercise. And this comes from a, a cartoon artist named Linda Berry, who's brilliant and wonderful. And what I'd like you to do with a piece of paper is to literally trace your hand the way you see on the left side of the screen. Probably you did this as a young child. This is a way to mark that you are here. This is a way of centering just on the page. And once you have your hand drawn, what you're gonna do inside the palm of the hand is begin to draw a spiral. I'm going to read a poem. It's not a very long poem, so it'll be about a minute. <laughs> and your only task is to draw the spiral and put all of your attention at the tip of your pen and just focus on drawing that spiral. And the poem I'm going to read is called Meditation Spiral by Rumi. And I think you just had an author who translated Rumi, right? So draw the spiral for as long as you hear the poem. You ready? You are sitting here with us, but you are also out walking in a field at dawn. You are yourself the animal we hunt when you come with us on the hunt. You are in your body like a plant is solid in the ground, yet you are wind. You are the diver's clothes lying empty on the beach. You are the fish. In the ocean are many bright strands and many dark strands like veins that are seen when a wing is lifted up. Your hidden self is blood in those, those veins that are lute strings that make ocean music, not the sad edge of surf, but the sound of the shore. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to think back over the course of your life so far, which is a lot. <laughs> And just make a list of five memories that you associate with grief. They can be big or small. They can be very personal or very social. Doesn't matter. Just five memories. Just jot them down.
All right. Do you need more time? Or is that seem good? All right. So read your list and pick one memory that seems uh, the most vivid to you. And the next thing that we're going to try to do is engage with this memory in an in embodied way. So what I'd like you to do is take out a fresh piece of paper um, and write that memory at the top of the page as if it were a title. And then I'd like you to make a big X on the page. We're making an X so that uh, it frees us up from having to write something perfect. We've made a mark on the page. We've also kind of created a graphic space, which can sometimes free up your mind. Again, it's another way of marking a place, being present. So you've got your title at the top of the page. You have your big X. Um, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I will ask them fairly quickly. You may not be able to answer them all fast enough, but that's okay. But as I'm asking the questions, I want you to picture yourself in the memory and to write the answers to the questions anywhere on the page. So this is also trying to free up our graphic visual brain a little bit. Does that make sense? And I want you to pretend that we're having a conversation so whatever it is you're writing, I should be able to see it too. So you're trying to describe as we go along. Everyone ready? Thumbs up? <laughs> okay. The questions. Where are you? What time of day or night does it seem to be? What season does it seem to be? Where is the light coming from? What kind of light is it? What's the temperature like? What does the air smell like? What are you doing? Is there anyone else in that place with you? What are they doing? Why are you there? What are some of the sounds you hear? What are some of the things you can see? What's in front of you? If you turn your head to the right, what's there?
If you turn your head to the left, what do you see? What is behind you? What's around your feet? What's above your head? What emotions are you feeling in this space? So now you have some embodied notes about this experience. Now we're gonna try just writing for five minutes about that memory. There's no right or wrong way to do this. You just start by elaborating on any of the details you've jotted down so far. And the idea is to try not to, is to keep writing without stopping and to try not to censor yourself or worry about the quality of writing. Um, I like to tell my students, if you get stuck, to just write the word tick, 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 <laughs> so you get another thought. So I'll start a clock and just write for five minutes based on any of the imagery you have here. And I'll call out about two minutes left so you have some warning.
Oh, two more minutes. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. So the next step is where the communal part comes in. And the idea is just to read what you've written without any context or preamble or, and it's just in the spirit of sharing this embodied experience. Of course, no one should do that if they don't feel comfortable doing that, but that would be the idea of how the exchange happens in a communal way. Um, so we could, Margaret, maybe just do pairs, go into a breakout room with a pair and take yeah. five minutes and share that way. I'm not sure, Lawrence, you joined us late, so I'm not sure if you, where you were in the exercise. <laughs> Okay, here we go. I was, okay. uh, I, I, I came in just as you were starting the X page. And, oh, okay, great, okay. And so I have written uh, for that five minutes. Okay. okay, here we go. Except I would like to, can I join a, can I join a room? I think so. Yeah, I think I can join a room. I'm going to hop into a room, okay? Can I hop in one? Is yeah. That... Can, can you see how to do that? Yes. Okay. You're muted. Oh, I'm going to pause the recording. Good idea.